Hi there, and thanks for joining us today here in the Natural History Museum's Herbarium. I'm here with Jacek Vaya, one of our curators, and we're here today to talk to you about all kinds of Christmas plants. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, James. Yeah, and of course, possibly the most kind of Christmassy plant that people think of for this time of year is the Christmas tree. And this first kind that we've got here is a Norway spruce, I believe. Yes, it is. Um, it's uh, also known in Latin as uh, Picea avius. Um, it's a tree native to um, uh, Central Europe and northern parts of Europe, uh, where in the 16th century uh, the German-speaking Protestant uh, Christians um, initiated or started the custom of bringing these trees indoors for Christmas and decorating them with uh, paper or uh, fruit ornaments. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was from there that the custom has spread to the rest of Europe. In the uh, uh, 1800s, um, Christmas trees were introduced into the UK by the German-born Queen Charlotte, uh, wife of King George III. Okay. And it was her granddaughter, Queen Victoria, that popularised it here. And I mean, obviously, like, this one connects to it. It looks similar, but it's a lot more kind of bushy, like, which, is that a different kind of Christmas tree? Yes, it is. Um, so spruce uh, is the original Christmas tree, because yeah. it is native to Europe and it would have been readily available to the uh, people of Europe in the 16th century mm -hmm. or 18th century. This is uh, quite a recent introduction to uh, Christmas. It's uh, Abies Normaniana, or Norman's uh, fir, named after um, a Russian Finnish uh, botanist, okay. uh, Alexander von Norman. It is native to Caucasus, uh, so the, uh, the region of southwest, south, southeast Europe and Western Asia. Okay. Uh, it's a really, really tall tree, but it's very, very in its uh, juvenile state, it's a very, very nice and bushy plant. Uh, obviously very attractive uh, okay. to customers like us. Yes. And this would be the tree that you're mostly familiar with today. It was only introduced in the trade in about 1950s. Okay. Uh, it differs from spruce in, uh, mostly in its leaves, which are much more flatter and less prickly than those of uh, spruce. Um, in spruce, the leaves are needle-like, yeah. very similar to this uh, toothpick here and they are also quadrangular, like this uh, match here. Quadrangular means that they have four corners, so if you roll a spruce uh, needle in your fingers, it will feel a bit like a match. Okay. Whereas the leaves of um, Nordman fir are much more flatter, like this coffee stirrer I just picked up yeah. this morning, uh, and they are also less prickly, so they are um, uh, blunt on the top. And also, if you look underneath um, the needles of uh, Nordman fir, you will see uh, two quite conspicuous whitish bands okay. of uh, stomata. Stomata are little pores through which uh, plants can exchange uh, gas like CO2 and oxygen. Uh, there are other uh, really important differences uh, between spruce and fir, and they are in their cones. So in spruce, the cones are quite large and they hang downwards. Okay. This is a typical spruce cone. They're quite woody, quite long. They look like little sausages hanging from the tree. <laughs> it is unlikely you will see them on a Christmas tree at home because the Christmas trees we tend to buy or, or bring indoors for Christmas are juvenile. Ah, okay. Uh, whereas in uh, Nordman fir, the cones sit upwards like candles on a tree, like in this specimen here. Oh, nice. Okay. This one was actually collected in Scotland in the Dowie Botanical Gardens in 1940s. And it is, we keep it in our collection in this Christmas box. Yeah. <laughs> Original Christmas box from 1930s department store on Oxford Street. Nice. Um, in Abies, uh, the, uh, the cones also don't last very long. So they would, uh, once they mature, they disintegrate very quickly. Ah, okay. So it is unlikely you will find mature cones under an abyss tree uh, in the wild. They would quickly disintegrate to release their seeds. Ah, and this okay. is what you would typically find uh, in your collection after uh, a while. <laughs> uh, sometimes we um, uh, tie string around our cone, abyss cones in the collection to keep them together. Ah, good idea. Sort of like a little Christmas present. In a it way. is, it is. <laughs> And then, obviously, these are for kind of what we use in, say, Northern Europe, but, you know, obviously, other parts of the world have their own sort of versions of the Christmas tree. 
Um, and this is one from Western Australia, I think you said. Yes, it is. Um, it is known uh, as Western Australian Christmas tree, or in Latin as uh, Noitia floribunda. Um, however, unlike uh, Christmas trees of Europe, this tree is not uh, brought indoors uh, to decorate homes. It is known as a Western Australian Christmas tree because uh, it flowers quite profusely with these beautiful, beautiful, vividly orange, uh, yellow flowers mm -hmm. uh, at the same time as Christmas in mm -hmm. Australia. Remember that Australia is on a different hemisphere than Europe and there our Christmas coincides with the summertime. Yes. So this, this would flower profusely at the time and this is why it is called a uh, Western Australian Christmas tree. This uh, tree is actually quite in, uh, uh, sacred or important for the, uh, for the local uh, Noongar um, uh, uh, indigenous people um, and therefore it's not cut and brought indoors. Yes, no, of course. Um, and then, so we've seen like different Christmas trees so far, but then obviously here there's something else going, there's something growing on this Christmas tree. Yes, it is. It is uh, actually a quite cl close relative of the Western Australian uh, Christmas tree. Uh, they are both parasitic plants. Okay. Uh, this is a specimen of mistletoe, ah. of viscum album, uh, or the European uh, mistletoe. Uh, mistletoe is just like a Western Australian uh, Christmas tree, are uh, parasitic plants. Yeah. Uh, with uh, 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 hemiparasitic plants, that means that they are still green, they can photosynthesize, mm. uh, but they have to steal water and mineral nutrients from their hosts' uh, plants. Yeah. Um, in uh, Noitia, uh, the, the tree, um, it, it, it's a large tree and it steals its nutrients from roots of plants that grow around it. Yeah. In um, mistletoe, uh, mistletoe is a, a, a stem parasite, so that means it has to attach itself to uh, a stem of another tree. It's mostly deciduous trees like um, apples, pears, or sometimes poplars. Okay. But some species of um, um, mistletoe choose Christmas trees as their host. <laughs> and this is an example here. Uh, another uh, uh, example of a festive specimen oh, in our yes, collection. Yes. You can't get any more Christmassy <laughs> than that. Um, and you can see mistletoe here growing on the stem of a, um, a Scots pine or Pinus sylvestris. This specimen was collected in northern Spain. And then obviously these have bright white berries, but holly, another famous Christmas plant, bright red berries. And yeah, and also a bit of a shapeshifter, I think you say. Yes, it is. So um, holly is another uh, quintessentially Christmas uh, plant. Um, mostly in um, uh, English-speaking or German-speaking Western uh, parts of Europe, uh, where this plant is native. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, holly uh, is a quite a large tree, sometimes uh, a, a, a shrub, uh, uh, one of the very few um, evergreen uh, hardwoods grow that grow in, in Western Europe and also in the Mediterranean basin. Um, and for that reason, uh, it is often brought uh, uh, indoors at Christmas to decorate homes. Yes. Um, most of us know hollies for the uh, red berries, which are actually, botanically speaking, droops. Ah, okay. uh, droop is a, it's, it's a fruit very similar to berry, but it, inside it has a, like a very, very hard stone. Ah, okay. So think of uh, almond. Almond is a very good example ah, of, a, of a droop. Okay. Um, the leaves of the, the ho hollies are highly plastic plants. That means that they can change their appearance at will. Yeah. But it's, they change their appearance because they, they have specific, spe specially adapted mechanisms that allow them to switch on and off certain genes that are responsible for, for production of prickles. Okay. So you would typically find prickly holly leaves on the lower branches of a holly tree or a holly bush because this is um, where the holly would be nibbled by herbivores like mm -hmm. deer in uh, the UK, or perhaps goats in the Mediterranean basin. Yeah. Whereas the leaves on the top of the plant are typically less prickly, like this one oh, here. Oh yeah, that's quite different. Because obviously this is where the herbivores cannot reach. Yes. And this is a very good example of uh, what we know in botany as heterophyly, which mm -hmm. means uh, appearance, different appearance of leaves on the same plant depending on environmental condition. Mm -hmm. And the mechanism, that, the mechanism that is responsible for this is known as epigenetics. Okay. So epigenetics is a phenomenon where plants can uh, modulate or um, uh, uh, regulate how they express their DNA by uh, uh, methylation. 
Okay. Uh, and they can switch on and off certain genes responsible for certain characters, like in this case, prickliness. It's incredible how much, how much there is to learn about all these different Trismus plants. And yeah, I mean, thank you very much for taking me and everyone at home through it. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed that. If you've enjoyed this video, why not spruce up your subscriptions by signing up for more content from the Natural History Museum. In the meantime, don't forget to like, share and comment down below.